David Card, Premi Nobel d'Economia de l'any 2021 i professor d'Economia a la Universitat de Berkeley, va impartir la lliçó inaugural de la Facultat de Ciències Econòmiques de la UPF del curs 2024-2025. La lliçó d'aquest any es titulava Evidence-Based Public Policy. David Card, nascut l'any 1956 a Canadà, ha desenvolupat models economètrics per aplicar-los a problemes econòmics de tipus empíric. Per aquestes contribucions va ser pel que va ser guardonat amb el Premi Nobel. La taula va ser presidida per Teresa Montllau i Joan Monràs, professors de la UPF. Per la seva banda, la rectora de la UPF, Laia de Nadal, va ser l'encarregada de presentar l'orador. David Carr va centrar la seva conferència al voltant de la idea de què es pot considerar evidència científica en el camp econòmic. Va començar explicant l'enfoc que avui en dia encara hi ha al voltant del concepte mètode científic. Let's start with the topic of scientific evidence. So when you're a high school student, at least in North America, in the ninth grade or tenth grade, you're taught about the idea of um, the scientific method. And they do a terrible job of explaining this, uh, but <laughs> uh, what's supposed to be true in, in the scientific method, at least as I recall it, I looked it up recently to make sure I remembered it right, was you were supposed to propose an hypothesis and test it. And a, a classic example of that uh, was Boyle's uh, Airbell experiment. So Boyle was the guy who discovered Boyle's law, which is a law of um, uh, thermodynamics describing the relation between pressure and temperature. Uh, and this is Boyle, Mr. Boyle, right here. And uh, this is a bird in a glass jar. And uh, Boyle invented a, a vacuum pump. Uh, actually, that wasn't a thing that was well known. And what he did with the vacuum pump is pump the air out of the, the bell jar, and you could observe that the dove would die. And did this many times all through Europe. He went around. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was so famous that this very well-known painter did this picture. Um, now, what that's an example of is something that uh, I think that's kind of what we're trying to teach students in high school about, is this idea that you can propose an hypothesis and test it with a single decisive measurement. A continuació, va posar un exemple sobre quines conseqüències té en un experiment científic el fet d'afegir variables aleatòries, com per exemple un grup d'estudi. Aquest enfoc, va explicar, obre la porta a imaginar el que va anomenar, no sense ironia, universos paral·lels. This is an example. This is a, the idea of a, of a randomized controlled trial with two uh, groups, a control group and a treatment group. And in, in an RCT, the reason why it's called randomized is because you take this a, a potential population and you split them randomly, okay? It cannot be deterministic. It has to be random. Ideally, in uh, medical experiments, um, the subjects don't know their status, which is one of the reasons why we, they would be given these placebo pills or placebo injections so that they don't really know whether they've been affected or not to try and avoid the problem that when people think that they've been treated, they can actually have some quote unquote placebo effect. In addition, in, in uh, good uh, medical experiments, the people who are doing the measurements don't know who's who because of course, inevitably, they're gonna be a little bit biased. Uh, and so when that's done, what people do is they compare the outcomes of the treatment group and the control group, and they say that's the result of that RCT. So why does that work? This gives me an opportunity to bring up Star Trek, which you never want to pass up if you're giving a public lecture, although uh, it's not entirely clear that anybody in this audience remembers um, <laughs> this particular episode. This is not Spock and Kirk. This is evil Spock and evil Kirk. And uh, what's going on is... Uh, that when you randomly split the population, you're creating a parallel universe. And if you know Star Trek, you know that the number one repeating theme is one of parallel universes. So what the, kind of, what the control group does is it provides uh, what we now call in economics a counterfactual, which you could think of as the parallel universe for what the treatment group would be if they hadn't been treated. Tot seguit, va aplicar la seva metodologia a casos aplicats a les ciències econòmiques, com el salari mínim. In the 1980s, the, in the United States, there used to be a single federal minimum wage, and there was a provision on the books in many states that they could have their own minimum wage, but throughout the 70s, the, the federal government had raised the minimum wage to a level that no states felt like they needed to go beyond that. But by the end of the Reagan era, in the end of the 1980s, the federal minimum wage had been held constant, and so a bunch of states started to experiment with raising their own minimums above the federal level. And that creates uh, what uh, we could call a natural experiment. Um, another example, I'll be talking about this one in a, in a minute, 
is if you're trying to study what's the effect of a, a, a violent separatist movement. So this happened in my home country of Canada in the 1970s in Quebec. It happened in the Basque region around the same time. Now there's a, another example where you couldn't imagine an RCT, but maybe you could think of a, a non-experimental design. So these are called natural experiments or quasi-experiments. Um, oftentimes there's a sort of a treatment group, so that's the set of uh, employers in a state where the minimum wage has gone up, and there's a control group, which is a set of uh, employers in other states. How would you know that the comparison group provides a valid counterfactual? That's the number one question that confronts a non-experimental design. Can you use the comparison group as a true parallel universe, or is there other things that are different about that? And almost always, the two groups will not be the same. So almost always, when you have um, a quasi-experimental situation, the characteristics of the group that get the treatment and the other group that doesn't are different. David Carr va exposar quines implicacions té el mètode d'usar casos d'estudi aleatori, el que un col·lega seu va anomenar diferència de les diferències. Yeah, it was, look, if you have a treatment group and a control group, they don't, maybe they're different, but maybe the gap between them in an outcome of interest has stayed constant over time, until now. And now, when we get the treatment, you would say, well, if after the treatment is brought in, if the control, if control group kind of moves along as it had before and the treatment group goes up or down differently, then we could say, well, actually, that seems like it might be evidence of a causal effect. Because in the absence of this treatment, those two groups, although they aren't the same, their outcomes were moving in a similar uh, parallel fashion. Usant el cas de la migració en relació al treball, Carr va apuntar que les evidències científiques moltes vegades donen resultats poc fiables, desmuntant alguns dels clichés que a vegades emergeixen en aquesta temàtica. We asked uh, two sets of questions. We asked, do you agree that immigrants lower wages? Do you agree that immigrants uh, cause a budget problem for the government? And so on. So a series of questions on economic concerns. <coughs> and then we asked another series of questions on what we called and I've never come up with a good term for this, but we call compositional concerns. So do you agree it's better if everyone shares the same language or the same religion? Um, and then what we did, we had five of each of those kind of questions, and what we did was we constructed kind of an average of them. And so we had one dimension, which is sort of your concerns about the economic effects of immigration, and another about your concerns about the compositional concerns. And then we had a third set of questions, which was, do you think we should be uh, restricting the number of immigrants or not? Okay? And what we found was that people's views on immigration policy are most determined by their views about these compositional effects. So 80% of the differences between people in anti-immigrant or pro-immigrant policy changes are driven by concerns about compositional issues. And you can kind of see that very clearly in the data when you look at it because you see that, for instance, the typical person who is most anti-immigrant is a, a retired person living in a small town where there's no immigrants, and actually, if there are any immigrants, they run the hospital <laughs> where those people work. So it's kind of uh, like completely counterproductive from an economic point of view for the typical most anti-immigrant person. Per concloure, David Carr va apuntar que no es podien abordar temes socials tan rellevants sense incloure un enfoc crític sobre la metodologia aplicada per arribar a certes conclusions. Uh, so, what this, I think, suggests is that uh, a lot of times when economists are thinking about something like an economic policy of, of immigration, they should be really thinking a little bit more broadly than just a simple supply and demand curve. They want to be thinking about um, uh, issues that might come up more in a political economy kind of context or other settings. And one thing that's happened in our field over the last 30 years is economists now are much more comfortable talking about a lot of those issues. Uh, so it isn't, it's no longer, economists no longer just talk about GNP per capita or employment rates or unemployment rates, they talk about lots of other stuff. And what this seems to suggest is that might be very important in helping to inform a policy debate is fully understanding what are the sources of these compositional concerns. També va haver-hi temps per algunes preguntes. Al final, doncs, es va donar per inaugurat el curs acadèmic.